We are looking at the life of David on the Sunday evening. And this is mainly in the first book of Samuel. The last time we looked at the conversation that David and Saul had together after Saul had left the cave where David had spared his life. David had held up a piece of cloth that he had cut off from Saul's robe to show that he could have easily killed him and promised him that he would never try to kill him. He said that he'd committed the whole situation to God and he called upon the Lord to judge between the two of them. Saul was quite moved by David's leniency and actually wept. He admitted that he treated David badly and he now realised that David would be the next king. And he asked him to promise him that when this took place he would look after his descendants. And so Saul left David alone for a little while and during this time David was able to relax a bit. But chapter 25 of 1 Samuel opens up by telling us of the death of Samuel. This mighty man of God had looked after Israel for many years. He'd been chosen as a boy to be a prophet and leader of God's people. And all the time that he was in charge, the nation had no war, never any war. But the people had dismissed him in favour of a king. And ever since then, there had been wars all the time. Samuel, after his dismissal, had looked after the sons of the prophets, training young men to be ministers in the Lord's work. But now his life had come to an end. There were few more useful lives ever lived than that of Samuel's. But no man lasts forever. Time, like an ever-rolling stream, bears all its sons away. But at least Samuel died peacefully. And although Saul hated him for telling him off and for being rejected by God, he never laid a hand on Samuel, all the time trying to kill David, never once tried to harm Samuel. He dared not. Samuel being the, the one to anoint both Saul and David to the throne. And you may remember that after he'd anointed Saul, he gave him three signs to prove his calling, all of which came to pass one after the other. So Saul had first-hand knowledge of how wonderful a man Samuel was and would therefore never dream of hurting him. But now he died and we're told in verse 1 that all the Israelites met together for his funeral and they greatly lamented his passing. This was a great loss for them all. They owed him a great debt. Previously Samuel had promised them his prayers. Indeed he'd said that if he did not pray for them it would be a sin. But now those prayers were ended and that would be a big loss to the whole nation. I wonder how many of these Israelites were bitterly sorry now it was too late that they'd rejected Samuel for a king. But men and women have hard hearts indeed if they can bury those people who've done them good and pointed them to the Lord without shedding a tear. Christians must all learn to appreciate one another and to show this now and not wait until somebody's funeral before we start to speak well of them. Samuel was one of many prophets who God sent to the Jews, but like the others, he was rejected by them. They, the Jews never knew when they were well off. We're told that Samuel was buried in his own house, presumably in the garden of his house, and David, we're told, went down to the wilderness of Paran. And you can see by the way it's written down here that David's departure was connected with the death of Samuel. Possibly he felt that having lost such a great supporter as Samuel, he'd be in an even more dangerous position now. So he goes off to a place which is on the border of Israel, far off from where Saul was. But it may also be the case that David took a spiritual knock when Samuel died. Maybe without realising it, he'd been leaning on this great man of God and not totally leaning on the Lord, which he should have been doing. So perhaps those words, David went down, indicate that he was now about to go through another bad patch. There are many cases in the Bible where certain people did well all the days of so-and-so, some fine man of God, but when he was removed, they tended to cave in. Now verse 2 introduces us to a man called Nabal. He was a descendant of Caleb, that great man of God who'd wholly followed the Lord in Moses' day. It says that Nabal had possessions of land and was 
very great in wealth, with 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He'd done very well for himself, but he was far from God. He very much reminds us of the man in Christ's parable who had so many possessions that he decided to build bigger and bigger barns to put it all in and he congratulated himself on his success, not knowing that he was about to die. Likewise, Nabal had great possessions, but shortly God was going to strike him down dead. Caleb would have been very sorry that one of his descendants had turned out so rich but so ungodly and a Christian parent would also feel sad if one of their children was to turn out wealthy but ungodly. They'd rather have them turn out to be a poor Christian than a rich unbeliever if it had to be one or the other. Nabal sums up those other words of Christ that it's very hard for a rich person to go to heaven. The name Nabal means a fool. Why his parents gave him that, way, that name we'll never know but it turned out to be very apt. But Nabal had something else even better than his riches in his package deal, and that was a superb wife. In fact, she was everything that he wasn't. Verse 3 says that she was a woman of good understanding and of beautiful countenance, whereas he was churlish and evil in his doings. What a strange couple they were. Basically, she was wonderful and he was terrible, and it's all put in the same verse. So the big question is, why did Abigail marry such a greedy, sour, unfriendly, mean and bad-tempered man? I wonder if people who knew them asked themselves the question, what did she see in him? Or was it more to do with the days in which they lived, when fathers would have more say than their daughters as to who they should marry? And perhaps Abigail's father was not as intelligent as she was. Perhaps he was poor and he was only thinking about Nabal's wealth. So what you have here is the age-old business of good-looking women marrying men who've got nothing going for them save for the fact that they're well off. And women who do marry for money should not be surprised if they find themselves married to a Nabal. And yet the name Abigail means the joy of her father, as if her father delighted in her and wanted the best for her. So maybe Abigail's father really thought of her marrying Nabal would be best for her. But certainly something went wrong, for Nabal was not only nasty, we're told he was evil in his doings. In other words, he was a criminal. He was crooked. He was on the fiddle. And no doubt che cheated his workers out of their money sometimes. He was not a man that you could reason with. He would shout you down and not allow you the right to reply. He felt that everybody was beneath him and that he knew all the answers. Anyway, one day Nabal and his men were shearing his sheep. That was a big job. He got so many sheep he would need a good number of helpers and in turn that would mean that he'd need a lot of food around. Meanwhile, David's plight was obviously getting worse and the food he had for his men had run out. He had a little to feed his men with, but he heard about Nabal and knew how wealthy he was and how much food he could supply him with. So he sends ten of his young men to Nabal asking for help. He did in fact come in knocking on his door begging for food, which makes us wonder once again, what did David mean in the psalm when he said that he hadn't seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread? Because here he is beg begging bread for the second time. You remember he did it uh, with the priest. Well, maybe it means that the righteous may one day come begging for bread, but not their seed. Or whether it means that such an event would be so rare that it's very unlikely to happen. What we can say is that God is very concerned to meet the needs of his people. And this event does show clearly that ungodly people like Nabal can be well off at the same time as godly people like David are hard up. But once again you have to look forward in time to what happened to these two men later. In the end Nabal was struck down dead whereas David became the king and then he had great wealth. Over and over again the Bible tells us that living your life for God will work out for your best in the end. So we should never envy the prosperity of the wicked. 
Now David instructs his young men to be very polite and courteous to Nabal. Greet him in my name, he says, and send him a message of peace and assure him that we wish him no harm. And he speaks of Nabal as one that liveth in prosperity, as if to say, because Nabal is so rich, he should be willing to help people in need. Some people feel that David went too far in what he said, as if he was trying to butter Nabal up so as to get something out of him. But then a person who's walking closely with God, they might be able to resist the temptation to butter somebody up when they're trying to get something out of them. Particularly if they were hungry at the time. Think of all the people who go to work and try to butter up their boss so as to get on in their job. Sadly, at the end of verse 8, David even calls himself Nabal's son. Matthew Henry says of this, this was too smooth an address for such a muckworm as Nabal. In other words, somebody with such a bad character like Nabal doesn't deserve to be spoken of on them. In verse 7, David reminds Nabal through his representatives that all the time his shepherds had been with their sheep in the area where David was, his men had left them alone and treated them well. Never once had they stolen a sheep or anything else. And in a sense, they protected Nabal's shepherds, for had David's men not have been there, then other people would have come along and stolen the sheep. Anything Nabal was to give to David now would be repaid later on when he became the king. It is remarkable that David's hungry men had not stolen a sheep, and it shows what control David had now over them. It also shows that theft can never be right, whatever our circumstances, for David's men could have made up the excuse that because they were so hungry, it was only right for them to steal a sheep that they came across out in the open, rather like people today make excuses as to why they steal from supermarkets. David suggests to Nabal that he ask his shepherds for confirmation of all this. Don't just go by what I'm saying. Your own men will confirm it. But nowhere are we told that Nabal did ask his shepherds. However, later on in verses 15 and 16, these shepherds do confirm it to Abigail. In fact, they say to her that David's men were a wall unto them day and night. In other words, that they'd found that they were safe from any attackers because David and his men would come between them. So they did owe David quite a lot. It's the old truth that one good turn deserves another. Yet David does not ask for anything special. He merely says, Give, I pray thee, whatsoever come into thy hand. In other words, we'll be, thank you for, we'll be thankful for anything. Beggars can't be choosers. So David's young men go off, and they see Nabal, and they do what they're told, and they say what they've been told to say. No doubt in a very polite way, wishing Nabal peace and prosperity. And no doubt they expected to be given some food from Nabal to bring back. But it was not to be. For in verse 10, Nabal's answer is very nasty. Not only does he say no, but he adds insult to injury by saying rotten things about David. He was not only heartless in refusing food to hungry people, he was downright rude refusing to give somebody food when, when they're hungry, well, that's one thing. But adding abuse is another. Somebody might say in Nabal's defence that when Ahimelech the priest had given David bread, that had led to the slaughter of many priests, and Nabal didn't want that similar sort of thing happen to him and his friends. But even if that was the reason, why would he add so much insult and say such bad things about David? But in all probability, the real reason why he turned his back on David was sheer meanness. He wanted everything for himself. And like most mean people, they have to invent an excuse so as to give themselves a reason why they shouldn't help people in need. And the most often given reason for refusing charity is that a person doesn't deserve it. It's their own fault they're in that situation. And this is probably why Nabal goes on the offensive here. 
It's not enough for him simply to say no. He must run down the person who's asking him for food and help. The basic fact was that neighbour would not have given any food to anybody, whatever the situation, unless they paid him for it or they worked for it. Nabal says here, who is David and who is the son of Jesse? In other words, who does he think he is? He's a nobody. Now, Nabal must have known all about David. They were, they were from the same tribe, the tribe of Judah. Surely he would have heard all about David's victory over Goliath and how that the women had sang his praises about him having slain thousands of Philistines and how they saved the nation on several occasions. But Nabal says, who is David? It's quite possible if David had not have beaten the Philistines, Nabal would have lost all his possessions. So really got a great deal to be thankful for towards David. And yet he says, there's a lot of servants these days who break away from their masters. And that's what David has done. He's broken away from his master Saul. So it would be wrong for me to help him. If he'd have stayed in his original position instead of going off on his own, he wouldn't need help. But of course that wasn't true. David had no alternative. He'd had to run away from Saul in order to escape with his life. Christians today can be misrepresented and the good that they do be said to be bad by the ungodly. But then our Lord, the son of David, was said to cast out demons by the prince of demons. In verse 11, Nabal says, should I take what belongs to me and give it to somebody else? Do you notice how he uses the word my here? My bread, my water, my flesh, my shears, all this is mine and nobody's going to take it away from me. He missed the basic truth of life and that is that all men and women are only stewards of what they have. They're not the absolute owners. Nabal didn't realise it but this was his golden opportunity in life to do some good for a special man of God and to do himself a lot of good at the same time. If he had shown kindness of the Lord's anointed on this occasion, God would have rewarded him in the future, but he didn't. He let his golden chance pass him by. It's rather like what people do with the gospel. No matter how bad they've been in the past, even if they're like Nabal, they can be completely forgiven by turning to Christ. But they let the opportunity go by, they never get saved. I wonder how many people there are who've been coming to church or listening to the live streaming and heard the gospel over and over again and actually believed it, but they didn't get saved because they basically didn't want to be a Christian. That would mean changing the way they live. Now you notice that it was David's servants who took the brunt of Nabal's nastiness. And that's how it is in the spiritual realm, where Christ's servants take the brunt of people's nastiness who are opposed to him. Because people are so much against the Lord, some even using his name as a swear word, they will also be unpleasant to all those who stand up for Jesus and who love him. Anyway, David's servants leave Nabal and return with the sad news to David. These servants were young men, and young men tend to be rather rash and won't take things laying down, but these young men were different. They conducted themselves well, and they were not in any way abusive to Nabal. Having learned not to revile, they turned away in silence, which is what the servants of the Lord must do. We must never get angry doing his work, but instead spread the whole situation before him and let him decide what to do. David's reaction in verse 13 is very stupid, not to say hasty and severe. He told his men to gird on their swords and join with him to go going to get Nabal so as to kill him and his men. We can see in the latter part of the chapter in verses 21 and 2, that it was David's intention to kill all the male people who were working or living where Nabal was. And David seems to have made an oath about this because he calls God's name to back him up. David is extremely sorry that he'd ever helped Nabal because he wasn't showing him any gratitude in return. But was that right? Surely we should be good to people without expecting anything from them in return. And certainly David was wrong to think of killing Nabal's servants. What bad had they done? 
Most of them would never have known anything about what happened. They haven't got a clue what's going on. It's rather like when Saul killed the 85 priests and their families when they didn't know what had gone on. But you can see when people get into a bad temper, a big change comes over them and they start saying and doing things which are not only stupid and wrong, but it's entirely out of character. Just think how much Saul had treated David badly, more than Nabal. He hunted him high and low, trying to get him put to death. And yet he let Saul go free in the cave, but now he's thinking of killing all these people, most of them who didn't know anything about it. We can see then this important truth, that when a Christian is walking with God, they can take all sorts of nastiness and wrongs done against them without getting upset. But when they're spiritually low, they'll snap back at the slightest offence. People like to think to themselves that their bad temper is caused by somebody else doing them wrong. But almost always it's because of some fault or weakness in themselves. Another important lesson here is that David got greatly annoyed with Nabal because he expected to get help from him. Whereas he didn't get annoyed with Saul because he never expected anything from him. And it proves that we can get more annoyed with people when we expect them to help us than when we don't expect them to help us. When you get a needy person, perhaps they're living on their own, and somebody is kind enough to visit them and to do errands for them, that needy person can become dependent upon that kindness. And if that kind person doesn't show up one day for some reason, the needy person might start moaning at their good friend, whereas they don't moan at all the other people who never help them. Now in a situation like this, David would normally have turned to God in prayer and asked for his guidance. But now he's spiritually low and he acts in the energy of the flesh and there's no mention of prayer at all in these verses. He doesn't say, I'm going to have a prayer and then we'll go and fight Nabal. He says, no, let's go and fight Nabal. A Christian may resist a big temptation, but give in to a small temptation simply because they've dropped their guard and they haven't prayed about it. Pray lest you enter into temptation. There's no telling, no telling how much wrong David would have done had God not intervened to stop him. For now he sets off with 400 men, each girded with a sword, to annihilate all the men who've got anything to do with Nabal. See then again what evil even some of the best of people are capable of if they're not walking with God. We've often quoted that verse in the Psalms that says, man is best to stay is altogether vanity. But who wrote that? It was David who wrote that in the Psalms. But by his action here, he's proving that was true. However, on this occasion, the Lord worked behind the scenes to stop David doing the evil that he thought he would do. For in verse 14, he leads one of Nabal's servants to tell Abigail what had taken place and of the danger that they were now all in. And he says to Abigail that David's servants had shown their respect to Nabal, but that Nabal had railed on them. He'd shouted abuse at them. And he says that he could vouch for the fact that David and his men had been good to Nabal's servants. And David wasn't the sort of man to take an insult laying down. So it was important for Abigail to consider what should be done. For evil was determined against them all. And the servant further says that he would have spoken to Nabal but he was such a son of Belial, such a child of the devil, that it was impossible to speak with him, and that he would only get into a rage and start shouting at people. The servant was sensible enough to see that there was no point in discussing the matter with Nabal, even though the lives of his men were at stake. But there was a lot of point in discussing it with Abigail, for she was a woman of good understanding. Abigail would not be the last woman to have to sort out the mess that her husband had brought to the family. When the servant mentioned to Abigail that Nabal was the son of Belial, that was something that Abigail knew only too well herself. 
We can only wonder how often Nabal had snarled at her during the time they were married and how many times she tried to reason with him about something but found it impossible. All she got in return was abuse and the sharpness of his tongue. Well, next week, God willing, we shall see what Abigail does about the situation. But before we close the scene, now let's notice two more important truths. Firstly, that it would appear from this scripture that it is a sign that somebody is a child of the devil when their normal way of life is one of being often bad-tempered. So that it's hard for anybody, even their loved ones, to point out their mistakes or to reason with them about their having done wrong. And secondly, notice that God helped David by stopping him doing what he wanted to do when he set his heart on it. And when God works all things together for good to them that love him, it sometimes means working against their desires and particularly working against their plans. But it's all for their good to prevent them from doing wrong and causing themselves and a lot of other people much harm. There have been occasions when a real Christian has got so annoyed about something in their heart, they decided to go and get their own back on somebody. But God in his grace has stopped them from doing that, which frustrated them at the time. But when later on they calm down and they look back at the situation, then they realise how good God had been to them in that matter. So once again we've seen in this scripture this evening that there is still sin in the best of people, and this should make us feel our need of Christ all the more. We're all sinners, not only have we done wrong, but we're capable of, even, even, of doing even worse. So the big question tonight is, have you been forgiven for your sin? Have you come to the Saviour in repentance and faith and received eternal salvation? May the Lord bring us closer to our Saviour and may he keep us from being mean and keep us from being bad-tempered. Amen. Amen.